Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, navigating the human experience together. Hafadeh, Tiro, and welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we are continuing our series of stories, folk tales, and legends from the many cultures that make up our Marianas community. And today we're going to be hearing stories from America from Joanna Marie Dubiel. Joanna, welcome. Thank you. It's so interesting. Uh, you were actually recommended by the principal of the school where, you're, where you teach to as somebody who could tell a good story from America, only to find out you also have Native American blood. I do. And so I'm really looking forward to what you um, have prepared for us to share uh, today. Um, first of all, maybe you could tell us what is your Native American background? Okay, so um, I'm actually both Cree and Sioux, um, but my grandfather, um, that's where my Cree blood comes from. And he played a significant role in raising us, so um, from time to time he would tell us stories, and um, that's where I have gathered the things I'm going to share with you guys. Well, that's really nice that you learned these stories from an actual family member. Um, you were sharing that the dog is actually a... I don't know if it's a common character, but <laughs> it's a likable character yeah. in these stories. Uh, tell us more. Uh, the dog very much um, represents wisdom. So the origin myth in the Cree culture is flood-based. Um, and so the dog comes to the master and the dog tells the master, says there's going to be a flood, you need to build a raft. And because the dog always represented wisdom and was liked by um, the culture, the master listened to the dog and so he built a raft. And the dog and the man um, laid down on the raft, and sure enough, the earth flooded. And um, they began to float higher and higher. The raft was strong, so both of them um, were able to survive for a while. Um, and it was said that it was like pleasurable. They were like floating among the treetops. Okay, um, so they were enjoying this flood. They, well, everyone else was uh, suffering. The master and the dog were in um, good spirits. <laughs> um, but the dog, being wise, recognized that it was going to continue to flood um, and the water was going to continue to rise and the raft eventually wouldn't be able to hold both of them. So the dog advised his master. He said, you're going to have to throw me off the raft um, so that you'll be able to survive. Um, and I've always found it very interesting that the dog like made the master take action. Uh, the dog didn't just jump overboard and completely sacrifice himself, but he did allow and offer up the idea to the master um, to sacrifice him. But the master was the one who had to take action and he had to throw the dog off the raft. Um, but because of that, he was able to survive the flood. And after that, uh, the waters went down and the man was met by all kinds of um, people and animals, but those were actually the spirits of um, all those who had died. And so that is really where um, Native American culture has um, a very spiritual history. Um, and that's also the origin of the spirits as well. Is it, uh, is this flood story like common among tribes that you know of? So origin myths um, very much have to do with the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so even in um, cultures other than Native American, um, it's very common for um, a flood to be involved. So Native American cultures, yes, but even a lot of European um, cultures also, it's 
mm -hmm. a fairly common trend you'll see among cultures. So this comment you made about the dog choosing to sacrifice himself, but making the owner the mm -hmm. take action, like what's the psychology behind that? Does the dog <laughs> usually do this kind of like psychological man uh, mind game? <laughs> it's it's very much I like. I think it's the wisdom of the dog. Like the dog has always been a wise figure and he like he made the man actually have to make the choice to do that. Um, but in doing that, the man also like chose to preserve mankind. Um, if the man, if the master had said, no, I love you so much, I can't throw you overboard. He also would have in turn sacrificed humanity or that culture. So I think it was helping the master realize that in order for the world to continue, um, he had to make the cho make the choice to do the hard things. And I the find Cree it. the Cree culture survived. <laughs> and we are grateful. <laughs> I find it interesting that um, it was the dog that had all the good ideas, not the human. Is this common for like their animals to have a lot of wisdom? Um, definitely common for animals to have wisdom. I, both in looking at the stories and knowing the stories, but also just thinking of animals, like I'm an animal lover, my mother was a veterinarian, like animals are pure hearted. Um, animals, like they don't have all of the other influences that we as humans have to have in our lives. So um, I think it's that A, that they're wise, but B, also that their emotions are pure and their hearts are pure and they actually like want betterment for the world as a whole or mm. animals as a whole or mankind as a whole. For the world, yeah, that we all live in, right? Yes, that we share and cohabitate. <laughs> Need to take care of. That's also like a pretty strong uh, theme, I think, that runs in the Native American cultures is living in harmony with the, with the world that God has created. Definitely. You know? It's, yes. So uh, you have another story about a dog or the dog. Is it a dog or is it called the dog? Um, so in, <laughs> in the case of this story, it's actually multiple dogs. Okay. Um, so we went from one dog, um, sacrificing himself to um, actually multiple dogs, um, helping a man. And so there was a man and he fell very, very ill. Um, he was married though, so he had a wife to take care of him, but um, very quickly she grew tired of caring for her husband and she would work long hours. And so she couldn't always come back in time to take care of him. And her assistance to him became less and less and less. Um, and he grew sicker and sicker and sicker um, until she wasn't a factor at all. She just completely um, disengaged from his life. And he was too ill to take care of himself. So the dog comes along and the dog says, Master, we want to help you. Um, but we can't cook for you. We, we want to help you get meat, but we can't cook the meat for you. Um, you're the one who knows how to do that. And so what, what can we do? And the master was too really sick to come up with the plan. And so the dogs were like, well, we know you can't walk, but you could sit in a boat. And the master like acknowledged like, yes, I could sit in a boat. <laughs> um, and so the dogs said, well, what if we went and we set up a camp? Um, and we went and hunted the meat, but you could cook the meat at the camp. And the man said, I think I could do that. Um, so the dogs asked the man, like, all the supplies he would need. Um, so your basic camping, um, primitive camping um, essentials, and what he would need for hunting. Um, and the dogs went and they gathered those things for him, and they put those items in the boat. And then... Um, the dogs came and collectively um, carried the man to the boat. And 
one was in the bow and then the dog was in the stern and um, they drifted away and found a campsite essentially um, and set up camp and the dogs went and they hunted initially very small animals because the men wasn't able to do very much, much work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it started with like, you know, basic squirrels and um, whatnot. And of course, you know, even just a little bit of meat was able to help him grow stronger. And so this continued on um, until eventually the man was strong enough to, for them to be able to hunt bigger game um, so that they could get more meat so the man could grow even stronger. And so the dogs strategized with the man to um, trap a bear because they knew a bear would have the most amount of meat. Mm, okay. So um, they they put together their their plan, and I like I've always loved that they strategized together. That the dog didn't tell the man what to do, and the man didn't tell the dogs what to do. Like they they interacted and they decided what strengths they had that would work together. And um, using those strengths, they were able to trap the bear. And the man at that point was strong enough to um, cut it and section it into chunks of meat. And that's hard work. I mean, I watch reality TV. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I just know that bears are very, very large and must have a lot of meat. And that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Um, and so... From that, the man grew much stronger um, to the point where he was able to hunt by himself. Um, so at this point, the dogs felt like the man was strong enough and in a position where um, they could kind of tell him what had happened when he had grown very, very sick and wasn't aware of everything. And so they informed the man that the reason his wife had left him was because she had been unfaithful to him. And... You know, the man considered this, and the dogs asked the man, they were like, well, do you want us to take vengeance on this man for you? But the dogs, having been the ones who um, had really nursed the man back to health, um, the man had a lot of trust in them. So the man said, I trust you. I think you'll do what you think needs to be done. And so the dogs, being very um, faithful to their master, um, did want to avenge him. And so the dogs um, went and avenged their master by killing um, the man who the wife had been unfaithful with. They returned to the man and they told him this. Then they asked him, they were like, well, do you want to go back to your wife? And the man was like, well, what do you think? <laughs> So he's deferring to the dogs. Exactly. Okay. He he put a lot, a lot of trust in those dogs. And they were like, well, it's not good for man to be alone. So, yeah, you should, you should go back to your wife. But the dogs were strategic. And um, they knew that in the journey to go back to the man's original home, um, they would need to um, camp somewhere overnight. And they knew that there was a couple along um, that path. Um, who also had a daughter. And so they begin to journey back to the man's original home, and they stop over at this couple's home. And the dogs, um, they initially test the man, which I, I find interesting. Um, but they say, let's stop here. Let's, you know, stay over. Um, I'm pretty sure that couple will offer you some food. But when they offer you the food, can you ask to feed us first? Okay. Um, and so the man does. The couple offers food, and the man says, okay, I need to feed my dogs, so can I give this food to my dogs? And they say, okay. And then, indeed, they also feed the man. Um, and the fact that the man cared so much for the dogs spoke to that couple. Um, and so they, they saw him as a honorable human being um, because he cared so much for the dogs who were seen as such a elevative, elevated figure, um, and a very wise species. And so the couple were impressed with the man, and so they offered their daughter's hand in marriage to the man. And he, of course, deferred to the dogs because he needed to ask the dogs about everything. <laughs> and they said, well, your wife was unfaithful, 
And this, this girl, she's pure. Of, of course you should take this, this girl um, or this woman. And so the man did. He took that girl's hand in marriage and I suppose they have lived happily ever after. But I've just, I've been impressed in um, how much wisdom the dogs did indeed have, but also how much um, respect the man in turn gave to the dogs for that. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can imagine that story is something that could be drawn out for like an hour, the way it's told, right? Yes. <laughs> With a lot of embellishments. Th and there were like always that. embellishments. There were always like, I'd hear it and there would be other details and, um, but I think what I, what I tell is the, the skin and bones of the story. <laughs> okay, okay. So it might depend on the storyteller also, what Definitely. kind of embellishments they Most put in. Most certainly. Um, you have one more story for us um, from the, your Native American culture, but I, I wanted to ask what part of America or the U.S. are the Crees known to have been in historically? Um, yeah, so actually, so I'm from Michigan, um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of Cree there, um, but they also originated in the South, in the Southern United States, and oh, okay. just um, <laughs> slowly migrated, slowly migrated <laughs> all the way up to um, the Northern United States. So um, I guess they took a lot of land. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So what's the other story you have for us? Um, so the other story is not about a dog, um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but in fact, a rabbit. Um, and I also like rabbits, so this one also spoke to me, I suppose. Um, but the rabbit, he goes to the master and he asks the master for wisdom. And the master says, okay, I will give you wisdom. But first, I want you to take this little sack, this little bag, and go fill it with ants. And so the rabbit, rabbit considers the challenge and he takes the sack and he goes to the ants and he tells the ants, mm, I bet you can't all assemble yourselves and climb into that bag. The master thinks that you're unruly. He doesn't think you can do it. But in fact, um, the ants like the challenge and they want to prove that they can. So they all get in the bag and the rabbit takes the bag back to the master and he says, I did it. And the master is like, mm, good job. So the rabbit is like, well, where's my wisdom? And the master says, well, I need you to do something else for me before I can give you wisdom. And so the master asks the rabbit to bring him a rattlesnake. And the rabbit mulls this over and he lumbers off into the forest and he finds a really big stick. He takes this big stick and he goes to the rattlesnake and he says, mm, the master, he thinks you're small. He doesn't think you're even as long as this stick. And of course, the rattlesnake wanting to prove how large and strong and powerful he is says, no, I'm definitely bigger than the stick. And so the rabbit's like, well, why don't you stretch yourself out and we can measure you and we can see if indeed you're longer than the stick. Um, and so the snake accepts the challenge, um, and in so doing, the rabbit strategically um, puts the snake's um, head by the sharpened edge of the stick, and as the snake is uncoiling himself, he stabs the rattlesnake through the head, um, and of course the snake dies, and he is able to take the snake back to the master. Nice one. <laughs> and so he's like, I got you your rattlesnake, can I have my wisdom now? And the master's like, mm, I have one more challenge for you. Because of course things always come in threes. And so this time, the master wants the rabbit to bring him an alligator. Um, and this, I suppose, reflecting on your earlier question, like points to the fact that obviously we had to be in the southern United States because we do not have alligators in Michigan. Mm, that um, makes sense. But the rabbit, small little rabbit, big alligator. He's like, I can do this. <laughs> a very brave little rabbit. Rabbit's a little cocky. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And so he goes to the alligator, and again, he's cunning and um, strategic. And he's like, well, the master just caught an ox, and we're going to have a party. We're going to roast the ox on a spit, but he needs you to help with the scaffolding to construct the spit. And so the alligator is prideful, and of course he's like, yeah, I want to help. Um, and so when he gets out of the water, the rabbit um, gets a club and he like hops onto the alligator and starts beating the alligator on the head, which of course is very annoying to the alligator. Um, so he does not want to help the master anymore. <laughs> and he, the alligator runs back into the water. And so the rabbit is unsuccessful. Um, so the rabbit has to reevaluate and reassess his plans. And so he goes and he lays off in the grass for a while in the sun. And that was one part of the story that was always like emphasized. Like he went and rested. Like he Gathered laughed. his thoughts. He did. Took a breather. Um, and he came up with a new plan. And he goes back to the alligator. But he pretends that he's a new rabbit, a different rabbit. And he goes, oh, I've heard that a very mean, wicked rabbit recently beat you. Are you okay? And the alligator is like, yeah, well, that rabbit, he hurt me, but I'm okay. He didn't, he didn't really hurt me too badly. So the rabbit's like, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad you're okay because my master needs your help. We, we're having a party. We have an ox, but we need to roast it on a spit. We need your help. And the alligator is like, yeah, I've, I've heard about this party. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds familiar. <laughs> The, the rabbit is like, I'm not like the other rabbit. I, I promise he's, he's a bad rabbit. We never liked him. So the alligator is like, okay. And so the alligator gets out of the water and the rabbit goes along with him. And the rabbit brings up the injury again. He's like, how are you feeling? Are you okay? And the alligator is like, yeah, my head, it, it hurts a little bit, but the rabbit didn't hurt me where, where it really would kill me. And the rabbit's like, ooh, well, where would that have been? And the alligator goes, mm, my hips. If the rabbit had struck me on the hips, I would have died right away. And our cunning little rabbit <laughs> hops right aboard his hips and strikes him on the hips and kills the alligator, brings the alligator to the master. He says, I did it, master. Where's my wisdom? And the master goes, clearly you're already wise. You don't need any more wisdom. And I've always... Even as a little kid who just like was like, yay, animals. Um, I've just always really been struck by like the difference between like knowledge and wisdom. Cause, um, it was said that the rabbit was wise, but to me that was knowledgeable and cunning. Mm -hmm. Clever. <laughs> and clever, yeah, but not so much wise. I think of wisdom as being um, moral <laughs> and <laughs> applying to our ethics, but... Um, in that culture, wisdom was, I guess, skewed a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but knowledge and wisdom were very similar. And um, the rabbit succeeded, and <laughs> he was wise. But as a kid, um, that was something my grandfather always made us think about, um, you know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom. He, he passed the story down to us culturally, but he was the one who challenged my brother and I to really think about, like, this is said to be wisdom, but for you guys, we want you guys to actually, like, have moral, ethical wisdom. Mm. That's a good lesson. Yeah. It's very interesting um, to hear stories from other cultures through our own worldview. And I know there have been times where, like, I'll read a legend from another culture and I'll be like, so what is the <laughs> point? Like, what? <laughs> What's the moral here? I don't get it. They get it, but from my worldview, I didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Our guest today is Joanna Marie Dubiel. We'll be back with more stories after this break. Half a day, Zantiro. I'm Leo Pangilinan with the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who have made possible the many programs in our community like this show. 
We couldn't have done it without them. And if you value the work we do and would like to make a contribution to our efforts, we ask that you consider making an in-kind or cash contribution to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Any amount is appreciated and donations of up to $5,000 qualify for an educational tax credit. We appreciate your partnership and support. Sizus maasi, olomai, and thank you. Welcome back. Joanna, we have time for one more story, switching gears now from Native American stories to an American classic, I guess you could say. Um, so, Paul Bunyan. Um, is The name is known by so many Americans, um, but most people know or think of Paul Bunyan. All they know him for is being a logger um, and a very large one at that. Um, so. Paul Bunyan was known for his brute strength, just being really, really strong and being able to be a very effective logger because of that. Um, but being from Michigan, um, I got, I guess, some um, more specific stories told to me um, throughout my childhood. Um, and he's actually um, said to be um, the creator of many of our natural natural wonders of um, the United States. So for example, we have Mount Hood in um, near Portland, and uh, it is said that that was created by Paul Bunyan when he, um, he had made himself a campfire, and it was a very large campfire um, for himself and his um, faithful friend, a blue ox named- A giant blue ox. A giant blue <laughs> ox named Babe. Um, and so after, you know, they had stayed warm by the campfire for the night, he was a responsible, um, individual, wanted to make sure that he didn't, um, cause a forest fire. So he put it out very responsibly and piled rocks on it, but it had been a large campfire and he was an overachiever. And so he, um, put so many rocks on it that it created... Mount Hood. Yes. And wow. so that apparently is how Mount Hood came to be. Um, it's also said, so I'm from Michigan, Minnesota is, um, we're neighbors, <laughs> um, and Minnesota is said to be the land of 10,000 lakes, and it is said that one time, um, Paul Bunyan and his faithful friend, Babe, um, they were stuck in a snowstorm up in Minnesota, um, very, very cold, um, and they got lost, and so um, the 10,000 lakes are actually the footprints of he and his faithful blue ox named Babe. Um, so that's apparently how Minnesota's 10,000 lakes were formed. And then um, for me, being from Michigan, my favorite. Um, so he was in the Upper Peninsula. Um, Michigan has a peninsula. Um, so he's up there and um, he's at a logging camp. But it's very, very cold. It gets colder by the minute, basically. It's like negative 60 degrees or something. Wow. It just, um, that's another, you know, um, every time the story is told to me, the actual temperature is a little bit different, but it seems to usually end up around the negative 60 <laughs> <laughs> area. So extremely cold, and it was so cold that the flames on their lanterns were frozen. So um, Paul Bunyan and all of his fellow loggers are in a logging camp um, but they're big, burly men, and they need it to be pitch black to sleep. They don't need night lights. Um, so they take the lamps and put them on the outskirts of camp um, so that they can sleep in the dark in their frozen state. Um, I, I don't think it would have mattered if it was light or dark. I don't think I could have slept in negative 60 degree weather personally. Um, but good for them. They managed. Um, and they woke up the next morning and went about whatever you do when it's negative 60 degrees, apparently logging. And um, they forgot about the fact that they'd put their frozen lanterns on the outskirts of camp until we fast forward to springtime and everything starts to thaw out. And um, of course, naturally, fire started to erupt all over the upper peninsula of northern Michigan and even spread um, to northern Michigan as a whole. But Paul Bunyan and Babe being so large, um, 
were called to action and they stomped out the flames of the entire entire fire, therefore saving my beloved state. <laughs> so um, I'm thankful to Paul Bunyan for all of his contributions. What do you think Paul Bunyan represents for the American culture, the American people? Why did this legend come about, you think? I don't know that I can answer the why, but I think or I, I like his stories. I enjoy his stories because they're always like he's always taking care of the land that we're given. Mm. Um, he makes sure to put out his fires. Um, when there are problems, he solves the problems. Um, so he he represents that caretaker of our land um, and our resources. So for me personally, I think that's what I appreciate. Um, as far as what he represents, it's that we should honor and respect the land that we are given and called to take care of. Mm. Joanna, thank you so much for, Absolutely. I know you put a lot of time and effort into um, preparing for our chat today and for the stories that you've selected from your childhood. Any final thoughts before we go? I'm just so thankful to be here and I'm so glad I could um, share these stories with all of you and I hope that you enjoy this session. Yeah, I don't think we would have heard Cree stories any place <laughs> else, so thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. Our guest today has been Joanna Marie Dubiel and she's been sharing stories, legends, folk tales from America. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. Your Humanities Half Hour has been made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Democracy demands wisdom. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. For more information or to share your thoughts, contact the Northern Marianas Humanities Council at nmhcouncil.org or on social media at 670 Humanities, that's 670 Humanities. <laughs>